Okay, let's have a look at our first overall strategy then uh, in, uh, in this hedge fund reading, and that's going to be equity related. Okay, so as the name suggests, the equity related hedge fund strategies, they're focusing primarily on equities. And the main risk factor is, of course, equity oriented risk. Okay, going to be lots of uh, subcategorization really throughout this reading. So we're in the first subcategory uh, of hedge funds, which is equity related. We've got three subcategories within that. So long short equity, a dedicated short bias, and an equity market neutral strategy. So let's take each one in turn. Okay, first up, long short equity. For each of these strategies, we're going to talk about what the characteristics are, we're going to talk about what the role is in the portfolio, and then talk about how to implement each strategy. So first up, the basics. What are the characteristics of a long short equity hedge fund? Well, okay, you're going to be buying some securities and you're going to be shorting some others. Uh, the idea is, and this isn't uh, exactly rocket science, you want to invest in long positions that you think are going to rise in value. You can see on the slide there, the brackets are the opposite. You're gonna short equity positions that you think are gonna fall. If you get those decisions correct, you gain on both sides. Okay, now the combined long short position of the fund is gonna have an exposure to systematic risk. It's gonna have a beta factor equal to the sum of the positive and the negative betas. So let's just say for argument's sake that the long position has a beta of 1.8 and the short position has a beta of minus 0.6 while the overall beta there exposure would be 1.2 okay so nice and simple just an arithmetic calculation there uh, of the overall beta position um, unlike an equity market neutral strategy which is another type of equity uh, strategy what we're here is not looking to eliminate market exposure we're not aiming for a beta of zero here you can see there my little example we ended up with 1.2 um, in fact we're going to have overall a 40 to 60 percent net long exposure okay so if we uh, have a look at the the net exposures there you got 1.8 and 0 0.6 okay well you add those together the absolute values that's 2.4 and the overall long uh, beta was 1.2. So that's about a 50% net long exposure to the total exposures uh, of both positions. Um, in practice, studies have shown when we look back, we do a, bit of, a little bit of regression. Uh, we look at the returns on this type of hedge fund strategy, the returns fairly similar to long only funds. So that'd be an equity hedge fund that was only taking long positions. So the returns are similar. Well, why bother then? Why are we doing a long short? Because you get those returns for only half the risk. If we're measuring risk by standard deviation, well, that sounds great, doesn't it? If we're in the business of efficient portfolio building, same return for half the risk, excellent stuff. Okay, so that's the characteristics. Now let's look at implementation. Often, because you're trying to identify positions that are gonna go up and you're gonna take a long in those and you're identifying positions that are gonna go down and take a short, you need to be a pretty good expert in the industry. So we often take a sector specific focus or the hedge fund manager does. Um, so securities that are familiar to the manager uh, the, the, uh, the positions will be taken in those familiar companies. Uh, these funds also uh, have been known to invest in index funds uh, as well. Okay, so if you are market neutral, and we'll look at an equity market neutral strategy later, um, the returns on offer on an unleveraged position are actually very small. So a lot of leverage is going to be used uh, to generate significant returns. Okay, in the portfolio, where do we get that alpha? Where do we get that excess return over and above a benchmark or some other comparison. Uh, well, we get the alpha from the long and short to single stocks. Again, no, nothing too tricky here. We're taking a long position in stocks that we think are going to go up and a short in stocks that we think are going to go down. Overall, there's a long exposure. Why is that a benefit? Well, over time, markets tend to trend upwards. So if this is a long-term hedge fund and you're in a net short position, well, if the market's trending downwards, um, that's fine, but they don't tend to. Markets tend to trend upwards over time, so a net long position should be of long-term benefit. As with all hedge funds, high fees exist. Because there's a bit more trickiness, there's a bit more difficulty in this sort of management along short, uh, the costs are going to be higher. So the investor has to consider, well, okay, we know that the returns are going to be about similar to long-only funds. We know there's going to be half the risk. Are the extra fees justified? Okay, is the reduction in risk justified? And that's the decision that each individual investor is going to have to take. Okay, um, that's our long short position then. Let's move on to the second type of equity strategy, uh, which is a dedicated short bias. So dedicated short selling um, and uh, a short biased uh, fund. Uh, dedicated short selling would be shorts only. 
short biased, as the name suggests, uh, you will have some long positions in here. But overall, you're going to have a short bias uh, in your net exposure. Okay, so characteristics of this sort of fund. Well, good news for diversification, of course, is a negative correlation with conventional securities. So you've got a negative correlation that's going to provide you with a great deal of diversification benefits, uh, as we've seen before. Uh, the returns on offer, though, they're generally lower compared to other hedge fund strategies. Again, just going back to something we talked about a second ago, if markets tend to trend upwards over time and you're, you have an overall short position, then you're going to be sort of fighting the waves, a bit like King Canute trying to push back the tide of that um, you know, overall upward bias. So the returns are generally lower and the risk is higher. So it doesn't sound too attractive on the face of it, but remember those diversification benefits, that negative correlation makes some exposure to this type of strategy uh, perhaps worthwhile. Okay, implementation, well, we know if we've got an overall short position, if we're just shorting securities, we need to borrow the securities from the owner and short them. The idea is that in the future, when the price has fallen, we profit by repurchasing them. So a bit of the basics of short selling there. Um, managers do tend to focus on individual securities here rather than take sector specific focuses. So a bottom up approach uh, to identify unprofitable businesses. Okay, unprofitable businesses tend to decline in value if those, um, if those loss making conditions don't get corrected. Um, identify useless management, incompetent management, those with high debt that they're going to struggle to get out of, you know, potential bankruptcies in the future. One of my favourites, dubious accounting. If only the analysts were looking closely at the Enron. Um, the, the Enron balance sheet and the Enron P&L, we might have identified a short selling opportunity uh, sooner than they did. Uh, so all of these attributes really indicators that you're going to see a decline in the share price of a particular company. Okay, now a dedicated short selling position, 60% to 120% pure short position. Okay, so how do you get above 100%? Well, it's going to involve some leverage, of course. So short position overall, uh, there might be some cash used to offset the, the exposure. So a mixture of cash and short selling would see that exposure less uh, than 100%. Uh, short bias, you know, we're going to have some long positions in here in the short bias management. Well, overall net short of 30 to 60% of the overall exposure. So a little bit less uh, overall short position, as you might expect. Um, little leverage, maybe some, Okay, but not a lot. Okay, so there's a little bit of leverage, certainly to achieve anything like 120%, you're going to need to have some leverage there, uh, but not by as much, uh, not as much leverage as other strategies. Okay, as we suggested a, a little while ago, the main role in the portfolio is to generate some diversification benefits. Okay, there are lower returns and higher risk than other strategies, so really it's about the uncorrelated returns with other investments uh, that might exist in a portfolio. Okay, history tells us low returns overall with this sort of strategy. Uh, so really it's the diversification and the negative correlation benefits that make this strategy somewhat attractive. Okay, and finally with our equity strategies, we have our equity market neutral strategies. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is have an overall net exposure to the market to systematic risk of zero. Okay, so we've got a zero beta here uh, with equity market neutral. And what we're trying to do is generate some excess returns simply from mispriced securities. We're going to try and identify shares that we think on a fundamental basis are undervalued, take a long position in those. Identify some shares that we think are overvalued and take a short position in those. The return tends to be modest. Zero beta means no overall exposure to the market. So yes, those upward trending markets, well, that's great news, but not for this strategy because we've got a beta of zero. We're not exposed to the market uh, at all. Okay, so long positions in undervalued equities, short positions in overvalued, in the manager's opinion, often use leverage. Okay, the returns on offer, fairly modest. So up here. So in order to put some rocket fuel under those returns, we're gonna leverage up uh, and hopefully uh, get some more attractive returns. Um, really two different ways that you identify those mispricing. You have discretionary managers, that's gut feel. Okay, the managers might just know somewhere in their bones uh, that a security is mispriced. Other techniques used are quantitative. You know, we're using algorithms, we're using formulas uh, to try and identify uh, those, um, those mispricings. Okay, why do we take this strategy? What's the role in a portfolio? Well, we're generating some alpha, generating some excess returns without taking any market beta risk at all. So we're not exposed to the overall vagaries of the stock market. Uh, we're taking a long position in one set of shares, short position in another. Okay, overall, the beta is going to net off. Um, when the market then is volatile, 
This is beneficial because you shouldn't be exposed to that volatility. When it's poorly performing, it's beneficial because you're not exposed to the poor performance. Um, as you might expect, there's lower volatility here than a beta-only strategy, that one with a positive uh, or indeed a negative beta. Actually, within equity market neutral, we're going to further subdivide our different strategies. So we've got pairs trading, where we're going to take a long in one security and a short in another. That's going to be a common theme, actually, with all of these categories. So we invest in two closely related but mispriced securities. So either quantitatively or discretionally, uh, we've identified two shares that are overpriced. Well, well one is overpriced and one is underpriced. Uh, it might even be different classes of shares in the same firm. Okay, so you've got ordinary A and ordinary B, or you've got ordinary equity shares, common stock, uh, and preference shares, preferred stock, uh, in there. Might be a firm and it's holding parents, so you've got closely related securities uh, involved in pairs trading. Stub trading specifically is within a subsidiary and its parent company. Okay, so you take a long position in one, a short position in the other, they're obviously closely related. You're not going to be overall exposed to the market, you're really only exposed to in internal company risk there. Um, the positions, how much of the long and how much of the short position should you take? Well, it corresponds to the percentage ownership. Okay, so if the subsidiary is 30% owned by the parent, that's going to dictate how much uh, of the long or short position you take. And then finally, again, very similar, multi-class trading. So we are taking two different classes of shares of the same firm. So it might be voting stock and non-voting stock, common stock and preferred stock of the same firm. Again, either intuitively or using a quantitative model, one of them you've identified as being overpriced, one of them is underpriced, and you take the position accordingly. Okay, so there's our first uh, type of strategy, uh, which was our equity-driven uh, strategies. Now on to the second, which is events-driven. Um, now, event is quite a widely defined term. Okay, a corporate event could be a merger, it could be a, an acquisition, some sort of restructure or divestment. But what the hedge fund is going to try and do is profit from the expected outcome of these events. Um, usually equities, although derivatives can be used as well uh, to implement the strategy. Um, the big risk here is event risk. The fact that your expected outcome turns out to be different to the actual outcome. So if we, in the case of a merger, if we've got a, a predator chasing a target, if we think the merger is going to be acquired successfully, if it's going to go through, then we would expect the parent company's shares probably to drop a little bit using our historic uh, analysis and the shares of the target to go up. So if we bet on the successful outcome of a merger, that will dictate the long and the short position that we take. Okay, so what I've just described there is merger arbitrage. Uh, the second type of uh, event-driven um, strategy is distress securities, which is a very specific situation in terms of a company that's in bankruptcy or very near to bankruptcy. Let's look at merger arbitrage first. Okay, so we're trying to earn a return from the uncertainty that occurs between the announcement of a, an acquisition, so there's an intention from the, the, the predator company to take over the target, and the successful completion of that company. So in a way, it's a bit like taking out insurance from the acquisition or simply placing a bet on its outcome. Okay, so all good, all so far and good uh, so far. Watch out though, if the outcome of the acquisition is different to what was expected, you can lose up to 40% of your position. Again, that's looking at historical results uh, of these types of, um, of strategies. Okay, so in a failed acquisition, what happens is the price of the target will fall and the price of the acquirer will rise. That's the opposite to what would usually happen with, if it, with a successful acquisition if it were to be completed. So you've got significant downsides or left tail risk with merger arbitrage. Okay, now usually when uh, a takeover bid is announced, the default assumption is that the merger is going to go through successfully. Now, we know from experience that's not always the case. You know, competition authorities might step in, uh, the management might just fall out, negotiations break down, whatever. But the typical expectation is that the merger is going to be successful. So what the strategy will entail for the hedge fund is to buy the stock of the target, so go long, and then short the stock of the acquiring company. You will usually profit from a strategy like that if the acquisition goes through. Um, if you think for whatever reason the comp competition authorities are going to step in and stop it, then your positions are going to be opposite. Now, yes, there's returns available, but often you've got very high degrees of leverage, 300 to 500% of the, sort of the equity investment, if you like, uh, of the investors. So multiples of the uh, equity investment used for leverage to try and put some, uh, put some fuel underneath those returns. Okay, 
What's attractive here? What's the role in the portfolio? Well, these strategies tend to have very high sharp ratios or significantly higher sharp ratios. Remember our sharp from before? So it's return in our portfolio over and above the risk-free uh, rate of return per unit of risk over the standard deviation of the portfolio. As we mentioned a minute ago though, significant left tail risk, so uh, some downside risk. Maybe the Sortino ratio uh, might be useful uh, to look at here too. Okay, so that's the first type of uh, event-driven strategy, which is our merger arbitrage. On to the second now, which is distress securities. Well, if a security is in distress, we're talking here about financial rather than emotional, um, the company's nearly, nearly a, a bankruptcy, might have very high debts, uh, high leverage, the competition's you know, walking all over them, whatever, this company's not in a good way. Well, why are we attracted to invest in this company then? Well, because if a company's in distress, often the securities are trading at very depressed prices. Even although the true value of the security is likely to be very low compared to a healthy, thriving, going concern, just because of the, the distress that the market can see and everyone's down on this company, the securities can be underpriced. Um, you've got a, a lack of liquidity involved in distressed security because big institutional investors will steer clear of these altogether. So you've got a big investor class that's not interested in these sort of things, so you've got a lack of liquidity here. The less liquidity the, the security, um, the, the less efficient the price is. So perhaps a bit easier to identify mispricings. So if we were to buy bonds um, or, or, or equities in a distressed company, we're expecting some sort of resolution. Okay, we're, we're not simply going to buy shares in a company that's near bankruptcy, expecting it to go bankrupt and that's it. We're obviously going to lose some money there. Um, but if we expect some sort of resolution, and really we're going to look at two, the firm can reorganise, um, in which case it might convert its debt into equity. So you buy the bond at a very low price, the company reorganises, perhaps converts the debt to equity, it manages to trade out of trouble, and the equities end up being uh, a lot more valuable. Or liquidation. Okay, so if the company is going to liquidate, um, really what's crucial there is the, the seniority of the debt. Okay, so you might get back a little bit more than you paid for a senior bond in the event of a liquidation. Now that depends on the skill of the liquidator. It depends on the specific legal decisions that are made. So there's no guarantees here whatsoever. There are potential high returns on offer uh, with distressed securities, but as you might imagine, there's very high risk as well. And if you're going to be waiting a long time, and in fact, you're probably going to be waiting a long time, it's a long drawn out legal process, whether it's a reorganization that happens or a liquidation, it's going to be a long time. It's got to go through the courts. So you're locked in for a long time. If you want high liquidity here, this is not the strategy uh, for you. Okay, how to implement a distressed security strategy then? Uh, two different flavours. We can uh, simply make a passive investment. We can buy the shares, buy the bonds, wait to see what happens, wait to see how it pans out. Hopefully what we thought was going to happen does and we profit. Or take a much more active role. We're going to try and get a majority in a particular class of security, whether that's bonds or voting shares or non-voting shares. That way we're going to have some influence. We're going to have some degree of control over the bankruptcy process. Now, you need to know what you're doing in order to make a success of a distressed security strategy. Now, individual legal systems all over the world will deal with these uh, you know, administration and, and, and financial distress situations in different ways. Uh, CFA is an international qualification. We don't need to know um, in depth what all the different laws are around the world. But wherever the hedge fund manager is, they absolutely need to. Um, in fact, they need to know what individual judges are going to do. You know, one judge might make a, a very different decision on the same set of circumstances uh, as a second judge, even in the same jurisdiction. So lots of experience, lots of knowledge of the decision history of individual judges is required. Um, we don't tend to take short positions here. It's going to generally be going long on the bonds of the shares um, of our distressed company. And there's enough risk as it is uh, without putting fuel in the fire of leverage. So low use of leverage uh, tends to be the case. Um, in the portfolio itself, high liquidity. You know, we talked earlier on about the fact that um, the investor's um, investment is going to be locked up for quite a long period of time until the bankruptcy process uh, is, is finished. Uh, so you've got some problems there, but you've got potentially very high returns, but individual situations often don't pan out the way that you think they're going to do. So there's a high degree of uh, unpredictability inherent in this strategy. Okay, now on to the third of our six overall categories of hedge fund strategies. We're on to relative value um, strategies now. Now, as the name might suggest, we're looking to exploit valuation differences between securities. Okay, so if we think one set of securities is undervalued, one is overvalued, we're going to be taking a, a long and short position uh, accordingly. Um, with a relative value strategy, the most commonly used security is convertible bonds. 
Um, so that's uh, fixed income instruments that can be converted into equity at the uh, bondholder's behest or just relatively straightforward fixed income investments. How do we generate return? Well, mainly for, um, for premiums in differences between the two bonds. So uh, there might be differences in liquidity, premiums, uh, difference in credit quality. So if we're going to short a bond uh, with, with, low, uh, with high credit quality, uh, go long on a bond with low credit quality, we'll have a look at that yield curve difference and, and that carry trade potential in a moment. Um, differences in volatility, really just seeing to profit from uh, the, those differences in valuation factors. Uh, we're going to look at two specific situations, uh, straightforward fixed income arbitrage and then a bit more complex, uh, the convertible bond arbitrage. Okay, so the characteristics of fixed, in, fixed income arbitrage firstly, well, we've seen before in this reading that there's a, there's a common theme, isn't it? We're going to be taking a long position and a short position in two perhaps similar securities. As always, we go long on an undervalued security, one that we think is going to go up in value, and we're going to go short on an overvalued security, which is going to go down in value. So uh, no great shock there. Uh, what type of fixed income instrument are we doing? Well, it could be all sorts. Okay, So we've got ba basic debt, so uh, it could be government bonds, could be uh, bank loans, direct lending. Um, just the standard fixed income suite of investments is what we're looking at here. Um, overall, the, the, the mispricings we identify, they might exist, but we're not going to generate absolutely spectacular returns on those. So overall, low expected return. Uh, what does a hedge fund manager do when the return's not high enough? They put leverage under it. Uh, always all works well when things go well, uh, not so good when things go wrong. Okay, and in fact, that leverage can be significant. Look at that, 400 to 1,500% of the equity stake uh, by the investors. So an awful lot of multiples uh, happening around here. Um, the liquidity of the money, it's good to have liquidity um, with, it, with any investment strategy. Um, as you probably are aware, the liquidity depends on what type of fixed income instrument we're looking at. So US Treasury bonds, absolutely fine when it comes to liquidity. Uh, but you know, the, the more exotic types, you know, mortgage-backed securities, some convertible bonds as well, uh, they, they do suffer from a lack of liquidity. So uh, there are some risks uh, to bear in mind. Uh, there's a few different ways of implementing a fixed income arbitrage strategy and it's really um, dependent on what's, what the source is of the return that we're looking for. So we think about a yield curve trade. Um, we're going to be making our investments, our long short position, um, to try and anticipate or to try and profit from anticipated changes in the yield curve. So if we just do a, a little rudimentary diagram here of a yield curve, let's say we've got um, a yield curve which starts off like this, so upward sloping as you as you might expect, and uh, we're going to be th we're, we're going to assume that the yield curve is going to flatten. So we're expecting the higher duration bonds to go down uh, in terms of yield, and we're expecting the shorter duration bonds to go up. Okay, well let's have a think. What if we're looking at uh, long duration bonds? Uh, long maturity bonds, if we're expecting the yield to fall, we'd be expecting the price to rise. So we'd be taking a long position there, long uh, position in higher maturity, higher duration bonds, because we'd expect the price to go up when the yield curve flattens. When the yield rises on shorter duration bonds, well, the price is going to go down. So we'd want to take a short position here. Okay, so if you anticipate the yield curve to flatten, that would be your long short implementation. If you expected the yield curve to steepen, then obviously the opposite would apply. Um, there are, of course, interest rate risks. If interest rates don't move uh, the way you think, then your trade is not going to generate a positive return. But also you've got liquidity and credit risks as you do with any type of bond investment. Now, if you're trading in different firms, if the, the long and the short position are in different firms, then you are exposed to those individual liquidity and credit risks. If you're trading in bonds issued by the same firm or the same government, uh, then you don't have that because the, the long and the short position for liquidity and credit will offset each other and you're just left with that interest rate uh, differential. Um, if you haven't studied the fixed income section of level three yet, you know, there's going to be a lot more detail on, on yield curve trades and how to profit uh, from flattening, steepening um, or static yield curves. Okay, um, so that's the yield curve trade. Uh, a carry trade is very, very similar. Okay, so you're still going to short a low yielding and long a high yielding security. That is kind of what we did up there. Um, so the, the higher yielding, long, long duration bonds, we, we took a long position because we expected the yield to fall and the price to go up. Well, here, a carry trade is where you might expect the yield curve not to change. Okay, so if you're going long on a, a high yielding security, you're going to be earning a high interest rate. If you go short uh, a, a low yielding security, you're going to be paying 
um, uh, a low interest rate. So you benefit from the yield differential and you might benefit from price changes as well. Okay, so if the yield curve does flatten, if, you're, if, you've got, if you've got an expectation about what the yield curve is going to do, then there could be uh, some potential benefits there. But the, the main source of return in a carry trade is from those just different yields. Nice and simple, isn't it? Go long a high yield and short a low yield. Okay, so fixed income arbitrage, what's its role in a portfolio? Uh, well, we've seen the two sources of return. Okay, the spread, those differences in yields, uh, that might narrow. Okay, so we, we saw a flattening of the yield curve uh, earlier on. Uh, also, you got a return from positive carry because we went long on a high yield and short at a low yield uh, security. Um, of course, your expectations about what's going to happen might, might not transpire. In fact, the opposite could happen. Um, and in fact, if you, if you expected the yield curve to flatten and it massively steepened, uh, then you've got a widening spread between those two different bonds and you're going to make a lot of uh, losses. Um, the more leverage you have, clearly leads to more risk. In fact, the leveraged fixed income arbitrage position was one of the, the reasons why long-term capital management collapsed in 1997, which is one of the precipitators of the Asian financial crisis. So um, certainly back before the financial crisis, uh, the actions of hedge funds often were seen as being a destabling uh, influence um, in financial markets. Okay, so fixed income arbitrage is the, the first of our... Um, our relative value uh, strategies. Uh, next up is convertible bonds arbitrage, as the name suggests. We're going to be using convertible bonds. Uh, a brief reminder, a convertible bond is a standard coupon paying bond that's got the added benefit to the bondholder of being able to convert the bond into equity. That is like the bondholder having a call option on stock uh, with an exercise price of the bond um, itself. Um, so coupon paying bonds with a call option on the stock. Um, how do we benefit here? Well, because a call option is embedded in the, in the convertible bond. Um, you might remember from level two the different influence and in option prices. Okay, what's going to increase the price of that call option? Well, things like volatility, delta, gamma, all the Greeks. Well, studies have shown, we can see it, that the volatility of the call option embedded in a corporate bond is often underpriced. So if we buy that volatility, if we buy the convertible bond and we expect the market to eventually wake up um, and correct that, then we'd be expecting a price increase. Okay, so we're really trading on what we think is going to happen to the, the price of the volatility embedded in the bond. We tend not to want exposure to the other option Greeks like Delta and Gamma, etc. And we'll talk about how to, to hedge that. We're going to use long short positions here uh, as, as before. Uh, there are some liquidity issues. Okay, we're going to be taking a short position as we'll see shortly, long and a short position. We need um, liquidity in the market to be able to borrow those securities to take our short uh, stance. Um, so that's, that goes without saying. The downside is that convertible bonds tend to be a bit more complex and therefore less liquid. And depending on the corporate or depending on the, um, the, the, the issuer of the bond, the liquidity might not be there. So you've got a bit of a contradiction. Uh, we need some liquidity, but it's often not there. Okay, um, so how do we implement it? Well, we're going to try and exploit this low or underpriced volatility uh, of the call option embedded uh, in the bond. Uh, the difficulty is getting away from all other risks. We just want to be exposed to that volatility risk embedded in the option. Uh, so you know, we're going to take um, a long short position as we'll see in a second. Um, if the option is out of the money and it remains so, then the volatility in the option is not really going to have an effect. Okay, so the bond's not converted, the option value is going to stay pretty low, um, so the returns on offer are not as high as you would like. Um, what we tend to do is go long, uh, the bond uh, in a ratio of three to two. Okay, so we go three times a long bond exposure, uh, two times a short equity exposure. So we'll buy the bond. Okay, so our value, let's call it 300 million. Uh, we're going to go long 300 million convertible bonds, and then we're going to short 200 million uh, of the, the underlying equity. That way you're hedging away the gamma and the delta risk uh, in the option, but you remain, uh, you remain exposed uh, to the option uh, volatility. Um, when is this going to perform for you? Well, usually during norm normal market conditions where there's good liquidity uh, associated with the bonds. Okay, so normal market conditions, that's a bit of a judgment call. Um, liquidity from the bonds might well be a significant issue uh, preventing you uh, from implementing this strategy.